Ah, what have we here? Is that a seeker of knowledge I spy beyond the screen? It is indeed. Welcome, my friend, to the Dota 2 Iceberg video. This nifty little chart was lovingly crafted by Phil2244 on Reddit, and I have the privilege of making a video about it. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's get into it. This will work like other iceberg videos you might have seen elsewhere, uh, and that we start from the top where the more broadly known subjects are, and we go down to the depths where the esoteric knowledge lays. Each object on the iceberg will be color-coded as follows. White is for gameplay, green is for lore, red is for miscellaneous, and purple is for Dota 1. This video is going to be a lot of yapping and not a lot of editing, so if you want to pop up a game or do some chores while you listen to me carry on about obscure Dota facts, uh, be my guest. Um, explicitly, NSFW entries will not be discussed. If you want the answers for those, you can go looking. I also linked the iceberg in the description if you want to gander at it closely for yourself. And now we begin with the Herald tier. Base Hunter Dota. Dota by Bass Hunter is an iconic song among internet culture. It's most famously been used in the Ricardo meme, among others, and has a ton of covers and remixes everywhere. The song is about, well, playing Dota. Dota 1 specifically, as the song was produced in 2007. Free to Play Free to Play is a documentary made by Valve and released in 2014. The documentary covers the stories of three players, namely Dendi, Fear, and Hi Hi. It's a pretty decent watch, giving viewers a perspective into how crazy this tournament and Dota 2's origin was in general. It's free on YouTube, I think, and you can definitely watch it on Steam, both for absolutely free. I definitely recommend it. Even if you're not a Dota fan, it still has value as a piece of esports history. The International The International is the yearly biggest tournament of the year. It usually has a massive prize pool and accumulates a massive amount of viewers, both live and on stream. It includes content like skits, Dota 2 history, new hero reveals, and of course, the actual games. <laughs> the actual tournament. The International is always a banger, but if you ask me, nothing has even come close to topping the International 6. TI6 uh, cannot be topped, and I don't think it ever will be. True Sight. True Sight is a series of documentaries that focuses on the grand finals of the International. They're a sizable duration, and they feature neat little animations of key plays that took place during the games. These animations get better and better each year, and even though we haven't gotten one in a while, I'd love to see how high quality these cinematics could get. Dragon's Blood Dragon's Blood is the Netflix Dota 2 anime series that features Dragonite, Marana, and Marcy through their adventures in the Dota 2 world and beyond. It's got three seasons, and it received mixed responses from fans. The general consensus is that the seasons get worse progressively, but I recommend you watch it for yourself and make up your mind about it. Now we're moving on to the Guardian tier. Artifact. Artifact was a digital card game released by Valve in November of 2018. It took place in the Dota 2 universe and is infamous for flopping hard. You may have seen the infamous reveal of this game during its official announcement at TI7 to the sound of groans all around. There was a time on Twitch where people were streaming full-on movies in the Artifacts section because absolutely nobody, including Twitch mods, ever watched Artifact. Its main problems were frustrating RNG and a $20 price on top of having to buy even more cards. Meanwhile, games like Hearthstone and Legends of Runeterra did fine due to the fact that they are also card games, but they are free to play. Useless Skills Useless Skills is a reference to abilities that do absolutely nothing in a vacuum. If you're playing Earthshaker and you skill Aftershock level 1, that's pretty useless. Uh, for other examples, look at Luna's ultimate without any points in Lucent Beam, or leveling Lina's passive level 1. Without any other spells, they do absolutely nothing. Culling Blade counters Shallow Grave. For those not in the know, Culling Blade is a skill that kills anything. You dunk a low health guy, he dies. Now Shallow Grave is a spell that stops people from dying. Now, what would be stronger? The mystic power of the Nothal Realm channeled into a blessing rite of immortality? Or a big red fella who looks at heads like firewood? You guessed right, it's the big red fella and his piece of metal on a stick. Ice Frog 
Icefrog is the lead gameplay developer of Dota 2 and was a developer for Dota All-Stars since 2005. His true identity has never really been revealed to the public, but people have their theories as to who it is. Most of them think that it's Bruno, which is a pretty, pretty uh, reasonable guess due to that one clip. This was back here during the game just telling Bruno, hey, you know it'd be great if there was a hero that could have clothes that was still in the meta that could deal with, that could deal with Tinker. And Bruno, just, <laughs> and Bruno just looks at Blitz and he's like, sorry, sorry about Storm. It's not happening. Yeah, Storm's a hard hero to balance though. Old techies. Fountain Hook. Fountain Hook has a bit of a long explanation, so follow me here for a second. Chen used to have this ability called Test of Faith. If you used it on an ally, it would uh, delay a few seconds, and then it would teleport them back to the fountain. The other part of this Fountain Hook chicanery was Pudge, and Pudge has an ability called Meat Hook. For those non-Dota enthusiasts in the crowd, think like, you know, Roadhog. Anyways, the way it was programmed made it so the hooked target would be carried away to Pudge's current location. So, during the International 3 where it was infamously showed off, Na'Vi was on the chopping block against Tofu, and they were about to lose until some devious antics arose. Support player Puppy would cast Test of Fate on his mid player, Dendi, who was playing Pudge. Dendi would land a hook and drag some unlucky sucker back to his fountain and kill him. After doing this over and over again, Na'Vi eventually won the game and avoided elimination, much to the dismay of Loda. <laughs> Valve soon reprogrammed Meat Hook so that the hook target would travel to the location where Pudge casted the hook rather than to Pudge himself. Stacking Boots This is a reference to the fact that new players would sometimes buy two boots under the philosophy that my hero has two feet so I must need two boots. It's led me to believe that Valve should change all the boot arts so that there are two boots shown in instead of one. Uh, but I guess that still wouldn't stop new Broodmother players from pulling the newbie classic. Crystal Maiden and Lena are sisters. This one's just self-explanatory. Uh, they're sisters. <laughs> Silence slash meat murp. This is talking about the sound effects that play when you try to use a spell while silenced. Silence! and the sound effect that happens when you try to right-click a building that you're not able to. Meep, meep. Love these little sound effects, but I think they should do one for being muted as well. Jungler Roll Back in ye olden days, people used to jungle in Dota. There were very few heroes that could actually pull this off, and it usually required some form of summons or lifesteal. I had a phase where I would lock in Nature's Prophet, queue up a Midas, and just go ham for 10 minutes in the jungle. I didn't win a lot of games like that, but hey, <laughs> it was fun. This role gained infamy when Iron Talon rolled around, and games were filled with position 4s and 5s, picking Legion Commander to jungle level 1. It griefed a lot of games, and over time, Valve nerfed the jungle option out of existence for the benefit of all. 3-2-2 3-2-2 is a reference to Alexei Solo Berezin's bet that his own team would lose. It was only on one match during Star Ladder Star Series Season 6, where his team, ROXKIS, was against Z Rage. Solo placed $322 against his own team through the game, but never received that money afterwards. This led to a huge debacle where Valve had to write up a bunch of new rules regarding throwing and gambling, and this also rippled across the community, where if someone makes a throw or does something really dumb in a professional match, people call it a 3-2-2 as to say that they're intentionally throwing, as a, as a joke. Doom is Satan. In, in the lore, Doom's name is revealed to be Lucifer. He rules Dota's version of Hell and he was kicked out of Dota Heaven. Needless to say, it's, it's pretty obvious if you just take a glance at his lore. Tidehunter Kunkka Rivalry Through their voice lines and biographies, it's evident that Kunkka and Tidehunter are rivals. They fought each other in a huge battle which killed Kunkka? Question mark? It's unknown who won the battle, but it's implied Kunkka was victorious considering his calm, cocky attitude towards Tidehunter, and Tidehunter's bitter resentment and obsession with Kunkka. Dota 2 Song Parodies To end off Tier 1, we have Dota 2 Song Parodies, which spread like wildfire in 2014 to 2016. There were a few significant musicians in the Dota 2 community that made a lot of these, namely Fwash, Refresher Parodies, and Relax With Me. Perry and Flax also made a few, and 
honestly, they're pretty all right. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that we are never, ever, ever gonna lay together. Crusader tier. Shrines. Shrines were a gameplay element that used to be around the map and, and in the base. They were like a mini fountain. You click on them and they heal a good chunk of health and mana over the course of five-ish seconds. Um, they made going high ground impossible and people would accidentally activate them all the time. They were a neat little experiment, um, but believe you me, they had mixed results and even more mixed opinions. Tusk Bristleback Rivalry. This is a reference to a connection made in the lores of both heroes. One day during Bristleback's regular shift as security at a bar, he got a little tipsy and said, your tusks offend me, sir, to one large fellow from the Northern Wastes. The fellow from the Northern Wastes kicks Bristle's teeth in. This event is also mentioned in Tusk's lore. They have voice lines for each other when they're on the same team or killing each other that reference the event. No need for a rematch. Let's put our differences behind us. What do you say? A rematch with me was a bad idea. We should spar when this is over. Model glitches. This refers to the fact that sometimes replays will bug and sometimes the heroes will just have missing body parts or a missing mount or more commonly, no hair. Dota's replay system is infamously buggy and these problems have been happening for years. I still remember when Dota 2 Reborn first launched and there was this one glitch where Tiny's passive would just cause his model to stretch instead of switching to a different model. Shopkeeper's Quiz. The Shopkeeper's Quiz was a little mini-game that Valve made to pass the time during Q back in the old compendiums, like 2015. It would give the player an item, then a host of other ingredients, and they had to assemble all the ingredients of the item to get the question right. This was available on the Dota 2 website for years after its implementation in the compendiums. It's not particularly available on the Dota 2 website right now, but I believe there is a Redditor that recreated it. It's not updated at all, mind you, so uh, make, that, make of that what you will. Buying the Courier. You Dota Zoomers don't know how good you have it. Back in the day, you had to buy the Courier at the start of the game, and the whole team had to share one. And even after that, you had to purchase an upgrade to make it fly. There would be so many instances of people fighting over the Courier because it was a unit that everyone could control. Usually the duty of buying the Courier fell to one of the supports, but sometimes they just wouldn't, and people would go several minutes without having a Courier at all. The 2019 update that gave everyone their own courier was the best quality life update ever. It will not be topped. Ability Draft Combos. This is talking about the insane, overpowered kits you can make with Ability Draft. Some that come to mind are Sticky Napalm and any damage over time spell. Ursa's Overpower and Slardar's Bash. The list goes on. Ability Draft as a game mode doesn't get the love it should, I think. Um, I remember League of Legends even tried to do something with it, like uh, with Ultimate Spellbook in 2021, and that pales in, in comparison with what you get to do with Ability Draft. Rubik Morphling Coding Every time a new hero or a new ability is introduced into the game, there's always some coding chicanery involving Rubik and Morphling. Replicate and Spell Steal are very interesting spells, and who knew that just giving a new hero a few new abilities to use could cause this many problems? I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, and they're usually patched pretty quickly, but I'm sure if you dug deep enough on the Dota 2 Reddit, you'd find some in no time. Clockwork is not a robot. It's true, he's just a keen folk in a metal suit. Back in Dota 1, though, Clockwork actually really was a robot, and Clockwork references this um, in a voice line that he has. Bleep, bloop, I am a robot. Yeah, just kidding. Blizzard Lawsuit. When Dota 2 was being made, there was a bit of an issue with some of the hero names, as they were ripped straight from Warcraft 3. The most notable change was the Wraith King change. Um, for those that don't know, Wraith King used to be called Leoric the Skeleton King. But the problem of that title um, was that it was a Blizzard character. There was a Blizzard character literally called Leoric the Skeleton King. So Valve had to change the hero completely and came up with the Green Ghoul Governor that we know and love today. Level 1 Roche. Level 1 Roche is talking about a strategy in which a team drafts heroes specifically for the move of killing Roshan at the start of the game. This involved heroes like Ursa for the damage, Nature's Prophet so his treants could tank the hits, and Vengeful Spirit to reduce his armor. 
This strategy had varying degrees of success, um, but finding clips of it failing were easy as breathing. Lakad Maratag Normalin Normalin. This is the most famous caster voice line ever. No contest. Even outside of the Dota 2 community, most people who generally follow esports will know about this one. During ESL 1 in Katowice, Katowice? I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, anyways, ESL 1 Katowice, back in 2018, Secret and Fnatic were playing against each other in the group stage. It was a close game 3, and the legendary team fight commenced. Filipino casters Lan and Dunu uttered their famous words. Normally, normally. The meaning of Lakad Maratag means walk strong or walk sturdy, but more like walk like a boss. This was referring to how Fada on Razor walked up with BKB, and normally means normal it, referring to like a normal attack or an auto attack. It grew to insane popularity in the Dota 2 community, and was even said by Gabe Newell during the opening ceremony for TI8. Coming from 64 different nations is really challenging, so Lakad Maratag to Canada. One of the casters of the famous line, Andrin Palu Danu Pangan, tragically passed away in 2021 due to complications with COVID-19. Rest in peace. Unique Attack Modifiers Unique Attack Modifiers is an old game mechanic that slowly got patched out of the game in the mid to late 2010s. Some items and empowered auto attack spells would be classified as Unique Attack Modifiers, meaning that they didn't stack with other Unique Attack Modifiers. So essentially, you could only choose one attack modifier per game, or one Unique Attack Modifier per game. I don't remember this mechanic being all that frustrating, but now that it's gone, I couldn't even imagine playing without it. You'd have games where you're debating over choosing Lifesteal, or Desolator, or Scotty. Not to mention heroes like Dro or Viper were completely shafted because um, their auto attack and powers were both unique attack modifiers. Dota Underlords Dota Underlords was Valve's official auto chess game. This was made off of the hype from the original custom game mode, Auto Chess. Auto Chess was developed by a, a group of Chinese modders. The game mode itself became immensely popular, um, and there were people downloading Dota 2 just to play Auto Chess. Eventually, this game mode spurred off um, into a bunch of other games like Teamfight Tactics and Dota Underlords. Dota Underlords itself had a cinematic and some goofy lore behind it. It had a pretty small player base and it eventually withered away, like all Dota projects that aren't Dota 2 themselves. Archon Tier. Valve Game References Within Dota 2, it's not that hard at all to find references to other Valve games. Tinker's whole lore is about what happened at Black Mesa in the Half-Life series. And he even has the same voice actor as Dr. Kleiner. Sniper, Meepo, and Techies all share multiple voice lines with the Sniper, Scout, and Demoman from Team Fortress 2 respectively. Additionally, there are GLaDOS, Cave Johnson, and Dr. Kleiner announcer packs, as well as Wheatley Wards. Undying's voice lines also reference the Left 4 Dead franchise quite a bit. Uh, this might sound like copium, but I really hope that we get some Team Fortress 2 content in Dota 2, like a, I don't know, a, a scout announcer pack, something like that. Blink Dagger Extra Cast Range Blink Dagger has a hidden mechanic where if you use the ability past the cast range, your hero will not blink to the full range. But if you cast it to the very edge of the cast range, you'll get the distance you cast it at. It's a neat little mechanic that rewards precision, even though it's not mentioned anywhere in the item's description at all. Uh, you just kind of have to learn about it. Old Steam Avatar Combinations Before Dota 2 Reborn launched, the loading screens used to look like this. Um, so seeing this, some 5 stacks got creative and made some masterpieces with the way that the avatars all lined up together. OD's Name Changes Outworld Destroyer has been through multiple changes throughout the years, and sort of developed as a meme among the Dota 2 community. First, Odie's name was Obsidian Destroyer, but that got changed to Outworld Destroyer. And then it became Outworld Devourer, and then later it became Outworld Destroyer again. And at one point it was Outworld Demolisher, but not many people remember that. This led to genius community-created titles like Outhouse Decorator, or Outright Defecator. Muerta's lore comic references Artifact. Um, Muerta's lore comic states that she gained her powers and her guns when she beat death in a game of Artifact. 
not really much else to be said on the matter. Resource slash CDR slash respawn time talents. When the new Journey update dropped in 2016, a lot of heroes had talents that affected things like their XP per minute or their gold per minute. Um, some gave cooldown reductions and others just flat out lowered your respawn time. These were all generally seen as broken and over the months they were patched out uh, for good in favor of ability focused talents. Reworked hero models. A lot of Dota 2 heroes don't look like they originally did. To name a few, Shadow Fiend, Viper, Faceless Void, and Jakiro have all updated models. They all have been generally received as amazing, my personal favorite is Slardars. And I wish they kept doing them because, well, uh, there's a few who need it, kind of badly. Rubik is Aghanim's son. When Rubik buys Aghanim's scepter, sometimes he'll say, Father's masterpiece. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen Aghanim, but he, uh, he looks like this. Now, if you've ever seen Rubik, you might say, Hang on a second, those two aren't similar at all. Who was the mother? Well, people suspect that Rubik was some sort of puppet made by Aghanim, due to Rubik's jerky movements and his unstable posture. I personally subscribe to this theory, but I don't subscribe to how Aghanim is characterized, and a little tangent here, Valve really dropped the ball with this guy. They set up this mysterious, super powerful wizard who is the most, like, powerful artisan of his craft, making a scepter that altered the abilities of anyone who wielded it. And they characterized him as this wacky goofball who's not really meant to be taken seriously. Yeah, it was a subversion of expectations, but the wrong kind. Chinese hero models. Chinese Dota players are subject to China's censorship of bones and blood and other spooky things. I'm not going to pretend to understand the Chinese culture or their taboos. They censor spooky and gory imagery and I'll leave it at that. So Dota 2, which has multiple skeletons and various ghouls and gremlins, needed to change some models and ability icons in the Chinese version of the game. Every appearance of blood is replaced with black goo, and anything that looks remotely bone-like is covered up with masks and metal. I actually think the low-violence version of Lifestealer looks pretty epic-style compared to his western default. Pendragon Controversy This one, yeah, this one's gonna take a bit to chew through. Pendragon was the creator of the Dota All-Stars website, and managed the website and interacted with the community and whatnot. Anyways, one day he sees all of his Dota buddies working on this League of Legends game, and decides to join them. So, what he does is he shuts down the entire Dota All-Stars website and replaces it with a League of Legends advertisement. All the forums, guides, newsletters, gone. In an instant because Pendragon just assumed that League of Legends was going to be the new Dota, and just went ahead and deleted everything. Eventually, the website was restored and some of the lost data was returned, but that's not where this ends. On the Dota All-Stars website, there was a page where people could suggest hero concepts. Now, what I'm about to say allegedly happened, but it is foggy as to whether or not Pendragon personally did this. A good chunk of the suggested heroes from that website were used for champions in League of Legends. The guy who conceptualized Rammus was particularly peeved about his creation just straight up being stolen for League of Legends. Now of course there's no legal action to be taken since it was an idea without any copyright or anything, but I think we can all agree that it was a pretty scummy move. This means that we could have possibly had fiddlesticks in Dota 2, and that's a really hard fact to live with for me. Legend tier. Any hero can play any role. This refers to the classic motto of No Tail during an old interview where he said everything can work, referring to the flexibility of Dota 2. Every strategy can work if done properly. Every hero can fit in every role given the situation. Inconsistent root mechanics. Back in the day, the root status effect used to cancel certain abilities while others didn't. Some roots disabled certain movement abilities while others didn't. You, uh, you just kind of had to figure it out from experience back in the day. This still somewhat exists today, as Crystal Maiden's root still doesn't let you attack, but other roots do. Spectre is Phantom Assassin from the future. This is referring to an old lore theory from Sir Action Slacks. The theory goes like this. The Oracle tasked Phantom Assassin with killing everyone who threatened his life in all universes. Since there are infinite universes, Phantom Assassin started going mad and forgetting her name and softly fading away until she was nothing but an apparition. A specter, if you will. Coddle committed genocide against Night Stalker's people. In Keeper of the Light's lore, he was the first being to bring light into the universe. 
But when he did this, Night Stalker's people were driven back and nearly went extinct due to the presence of such a powerful light. Balinar, who is Night Stalker, is the last of them, and we can only assume his kind are elvishly immortal because he's existed for possibly hundreds of thousands, if not maybe millions of years? Radiant Dire Hero Allegiances This was something that carried over to Dota 2 from Dota 1, where heroes would have canon sides, or allegiances. Just as they were divided by Scourge heroes or Sentinel heroes in Dota 1, Valve used to separate heroes by Radiant and Dire up until they revamped their website back in 2021. Looking at this image, the top half was the Radiant side, and the bottom half was the Dire side. There are some outliers here as to who you'd expect to be on which side. For instance, I always thought Timbersaw would be on the Dire side, considering his hatred and fear of trees, though... I guess the Dire side also has trees as well? Rebuying BKB and Recipes Back in the day, I know I've been saying that a lot, you used to be able to sell BKB and buy another one to refresh the diminishing returns. This has been removed for obvious reasons. Um, you could also do something similar to items that had charges. If you wanted to refresh the charges on drums, all you had to do was buy another and it restored to full. Chilling Touch Debuffing Allies Chilling Touch wasn't always the straightforward auto attack and power that it is today. Far back in Dota's history, it used to be an AoE spell that buffed the auto attacks of your allies. It would grant them bonus magic damage on their attacks, but it would decrease their attack speed in the process. It was kind of a wonky spell, and I'm more than glad they changed it to something useful. Giant Hero Models In Dota 2, there are many ways to increase the size of one's model. BKB, Ogre Magi's Bloodlust, uh, and Giant's Ring are the usual methods that people go with. This could also be talking about the fact that if you put some of the hero models next to other Valve game models in SFM, they look way bigger than they should. IO Zero Point Turn Rate He's a ball of light. An actual orb. He, he shouldn't need a turn rate. I don't know why he has one. Forced 50% Sometimes called Loser's Q, this is a conspiracy theory that Valve fixes matches so you'll always be close to a 50% win rate. There's been studies done to show that if players just win all the time, their gaming sessions won't be as long as they are usually. So to profit off of that, they throw in some guaranteed losses to try and get players to rage queue and play more. It's tough to say whether this is real or not, and since Valve's matchmaking algorithms aren't public knowledge, there's no real way of knowing, but some games definitely make it feel like the forced 50% is real. The four fundamental heroes are based on quantum mechanics. <sighs> this one's gonna be a long one to explain. Okay, here we go. For those not in the know-how, in Dota lore there are four fundamental heroes. Gods, essentially, of the forces of the universe. These four heroes are Enigma, Io, Chaos Knight, and Keeper of the Light. Now, in quantum physics there are four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Now, I'm no quantum physicist, but I'll try to explain this the best I can. Um, I recommend researching this topic uh, on your own, if you're, <laughs> if you're interested. Enigma is gravity, for obvious reasons. Io is electromagnetism, because electromagnetism has to do something with light, and Tether is kind of like an electromagnetic interaction. Uh, that's my best guess, at least. Chaos Knight is the strong nuclear force. Because like the strong nuclear force bringing quarks together to form an atom, Chaos Knight's reality rift brings its target and clumps it all up with Chaos Knight and his clones. Keeper of the Light is the weak nuclear force because the weak nuclear force helps in the forming of stars, which, if you didn't know, give off light. Who'd have thunk? This decision to make gods that relate to quantum physics is wicked cool, and this won't be the last time we talk about this on the iceberg. Chain Frost on Ancient Creeps This refers to an old cheese strat that exploited the fact that ancient creeps wouldn't take damage from Lich's ultimate. This resulted in Lich players buying Aghanims, which used to give his ult infinite bounces instead of the talent, um, and they would spam their Chain Frost off cooldown on the ancient creep camp. Any enemy that walked by would be deleted by the four Chain Frosts just bouncing around in there. Heroes of New Earth to end off the Legends tier, we have Heroes of New Earth, another MOBA that unfortunately fell by the wayside while Dota and League conquered most corners of the internet. Its original idea was to be a port for a lot of Dota 1 heroes. It had an esports scene and was largely played by Dota 1 players while they waited for Dota 2, and it ultimately died out when its servers went down in 2022. 
I, I never played Heroes of North, but I heard a lot of good things about it, and it will indeed be missed. Ancient Tear. Gaben's favorite hero. Gabe Newell revealed back in like uh, 2014 or something that his favorite hero is Sand King. I have no idea if this information is still up to date, but as far as I know, Gabe is a scorpion enjoyer. Viper was Pugna's pet. Viper's bio is about how he was once the familiar of a wizard in the Nether Reaches. Pugna also happens to be from the Nether Reaches, and is a wizard. Uh, this is further confirmed in Viper and Pugna's voice lines towards each other. Ah, oh, Viper, my erstwhile pet. Arc Warden is an ancient. At the beginning of reality in the Dota universe, there was a primordial mind that began a debate with itself, whether it's better to act or to think. This one mind got so in-depth with this argument that it split up into a bunch of fragments. This is the origin for the Radiant and the Dire. But there was a third fragment that split, which was Arc Warden, who wanted to stop the bickering of Radiant and Dire, and trapped them possibly multiple times in moons and other celestial bodies, but it usually never ended well. Monkey King changed voice actor. If you watch Monkey King's reveal trailer, you'll notice that it doesn't sound like Monkey King in the game at all. That's because originally Monkey King was going to be voiced by Matthew Mercer, the legend himself. But Valve decided that he didn't sound mischievous enough, and they called in Bill Millsap to record his voice lines. Ancient Apparition is Entropy. This is where the spacey science comes back into this video. I guess everyone at Valve is a bunch of science nerds, because AA's lore talks about how, inevitably, he will freeze everything over, and with time, gets bigger and bigger. This is a reference to the theory of entropy and the heat death of the universe. The theory states that as the universe expands, atoms will get farther and farther apart, and particles will react less with other particles, until eventually the universe cools down for good and everything just sorta stops. Freezes, if you will. Lion's ult tries to turn the target inside out. If you read the ability description of Finger of Death, it'll mention that the objective of the spell is to turn your target inside out. I like to imagine that when you unalive someone with FOD, that the spell actually succeeds, which is cool and horrifying at the same time. Monkey King Broodmother Romance In Monkey King's release comic, while he's signing autographs, Broodmother comes up to him, mocking him and taunting him, hinting that they were a couple once and now are bitter exes. I also find it funny how everyone in the crowd is just okay with this giant spider just, you know, kind of being there. Uh, anyways, it's hinted that their relationship began back when Monkey King was imprisoned under a mountain, and Broodmother, coincidentally, also lived inside a mountain at one point. And that is how the two met. Headshot Monkey King Bar Mini Stun. Back in the day, Monkey King Bar used to have a passive that, when it procced, it also produced a quick little mini stun. And even farther back, Sniper's Headshot used to do the same thing, which was just, just so much fun. It was just great. Renamed Heroes. This is somewhat part of the same story as the Blizzard lawsuit from a couple tiers ago. Valve changed a lot of hero names to avoid enraging Blizzard even further. Uh, for some examples, Wind Ranger used to be Wind Runner, Necrophos used to be Necrolite, and Furion used to be Malfurion, uh, which were all names of existing Warcraft characters. Legion Commander Gender Swap In Dota 1, Legion Commander was a male character. I'm not entirely sure why Valve made this decision, but I find it interesting that they did. Shiver Ravage. A Shiver Ravage refers to a Tidehunter ult that hits absolutely nobody. This became a meme when legendary caster and analyst Shiver was streaming one fateful day. It was actually Sing Sing who was streaming, but Shiver was uh, was with him. She was playing Tidehunter and pressed R, and nobody got hit. Man, they're saving him. I'm running in. No, he's gonna Shiver. take it yes. I've got Ravage Look, in seven seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, no! Fuck! There was nobody there anymore. Oh, there's one. <laughs> the clip blew up on Reddit, and it became a staple of the community ever since. The Great Confluence. This is something you hear in Void Spirit's voice lines a lot. He's always yapping about this Great Confluence. This is supposedly an event that happens after the War of the Ancients. Some people theorize it's all dimensions collapsing into one. Others think it could be a future update in which all the unique heroes from Heroes of New Earth get ported over to Dota 2. Seeing as how we're getting heroes like Ringmaster tells me this isn't the case, and these Heroes of New Earth fellas are going to be slowly integrated into Dota 2 over time. Camp Stacking Exploits 
At the end of the Ancient Tier, we have a very funny interaction with a Darkseer's Vacuum and a few other position manipulating spells. People would grab a creep camp, then vacuum it up a cliff, then rinse and repeat indefinitely. It made a ton of cash, but it was eventually patched out. The Divine Tier. Shopkeepers are more powerful than heroes. This refers to a neat bit of lore about shopkeepers in the Dota 2 universe. Shopkeepers are charged with holding on to powerful magical artifacts and giving them to heroes worthy enough through the trade of gold. To keep from thieves getting their hands on godlike powers, the gods of the Dota 2 universe made a pact with shopkeepers. If anyone steals from or kills a shopkeeper, that individual will be under the wrath of every god ever. Uh, which is most likely a bad thing. Ricky was here. This refers to a little spot on Treant Protector's model where you can find the text Ricky was here carved into his bark. Roshan is a Smeevil. This theory, it's probably true, stems from the fact that Roshan's horns look very much like a Smeevil's horns. Even though Smeevils only have three fingers and no wings, this could still be possible. See, Roshan's story is that he was once a shopkeeper's assistant when one day his shopkeeper was tasked with keeping hold of the Aegis of Immortality. Whoever possessed it would come back to life after dying, and thus it was a pretty powerful artifact. Roshan was tempted to steal it and eventually caved, killing his shopkeeper so that he might claim immortality. But since the gods had the shopkeeper's backs, Roshan underwent a heavy punishment. He would be locked to a tarn, or two tarns now, where he'd have to be killed for this Aegis over and over again. Roshan did get immortality in the end, but at a very heavy price. I imagine Roshan underwent a transformation when he was cursed, giving him a more monstrous, stronger appearance since Smeevils in the Dota 2 universe are slightly bigger than a cat. Toss Buyback Glitch This refers to a glitch where if Tiny tossed someone into the air, then the person died while in the air, and bought back before their corpse landed, they would respawn right where they were killed. It took an embarrassingly long time for Valve to fix this, and it ruined a lot of games. Every week there'd be a new clip of this glitch circulating around. Thank god it's patched. Late game visual bugs. I'm not too sure what this one is talking about, but it sounds relatively self-explanatory. It's patched out, but if games went really late, there would be visual bugs, like radiant or dire particle effects appearing everywhere, like the northern lights or something. Hero teasers in promotional images. Valve loves their teasers and easter eggs, and they still do this to this day. In promotional art, Valve would hide upcoming heroes in the background, or off to the side, or something. Notable instances of this are Nyx Assassin in the shadows of Disruptor's art, and Ringmaster's circus ticket on the new Frontiers map. Legion Commander is racist. This refers to the voice lines Legion Commander has when she kills specific types of heroes. She'll say, never trust a blank and the blank would be filled in with whatever it was she just killed. Never trust a fish. NEVER TRUST A TREE! Never trust a... What are you, anyway? This also refers to Legion Commander from Dota 1, who had a lot of voice lines like Dirty Orcs and Filthy Trolls. Brewmaster Elemental Damage Back in the day, Brewmaster used to have this one mechanic on his Cinder Brew, where if his W was splashed on someone, any fire spell would light it and give them a DOT status effect. This was a really cool addition to the game, maybe it wasn't balanced, but it's such a shame they gave up on a mechanic like this. Shitty Wizard Every single hero has a voice line where they say, Shitty Wizard and Crummy Wizard. This is an inside joke at Valve Headquarters where they place all the blame for the game's bugs on one fictional person. Adrian Finnell, a senior programmer at Valve, is supposedly the inspiration for this bug-causing wizard. Uh, this wizard fella, named Dolph Rat, is seen everywhere in the game from couriers to the tutorial. For years and years I've wondered why all the heroes had this voice line, and after researching this video I'm, I'm finally finding out. The Mad Moon The Mad Moon is, or was, the moon of Rue, the planet Dota 2 takes place on. It was the moon that Ark Warden stuffed the two warring ancients inside of before they broke out via fighting too hard. When the moon exploded, the shards came down and crashed onto the planet, and those shards of moon rock became the ancients that we know and defend today. Invoker's real name is Carl. This is a reference to Invoker's Dota 1 name, Kale, which kinda sounds like Carl. This is even a voice line you can get in Invoker's Dota Plus progression. Throughout the eons, I have been known by many names. 
But my true name of power is Carl. Pocket Ricky. Pocket Ricky used to be an old meme on the Dota 2 subreddit. It was kind of like how, how Ricky could come out of nowhere as if he jumped from someone's pocket or something like that. It had a bit of a comeback when Valve uh, actually made Pocket Ricky a real thing with his Aghanim Scepter. It's still in the game to this day, as a matter of fact. Tinker is Dota's version of a Black Mesa scientist. If you've ever read Tinker's lore, it talks about an event at Purple Plateau, which is a dead giveaway that he's just Kleiner in, in Dota 2. Same voice actor, lots of voice line references, the works. Ozkavash. Ozkavash is a demonic language in Dota 2. All of the demon characters speak it except Queen of Pain, Underlord, and Warlock's Golem. Additionally, Legion Commander's Arcana has a few voice lines in Ozkavash. These voice lines can be translated on the wiki if you're curious. Different planes slash realms. After playing a few of the neon colored characters, you'll begin to realize that there are a lot of dimensions in the Dota 2 universe. Obviously, you have Hell and its seven circles, then you have the Nether Reaches, where Pugna and Viper are from, then you have Kalajarim, Faithless Void's dimension which exists out of time, and the Underscape where Razor and Visage can be found. The Immortal Tear Coddle is a pervert. This refers to the fact that Keeper of the Light has a voice line for every female character, outside of the recent ones, where he compliments them on their beauty, or what have you. Personally, I don't think it's grounds for calling someone a pervert, just... The dude likes women, who can blame him? Troll Warlord's lore is about internet trolls. A brisk read-through of Troll Warlord's lore will reveal that it's pretty clearly talking about internet trolls in real life. It talks about how trolls spend their developmental years tucked away in their mother's cave, contributing nothing to society, and about how trolls will never shy away to voice their opinions in disputes. This is also something I never really thought about until now, but it does call into question if Witch Doctor and Dazzle and Huskar grew up in similar cultures as well as since they are all trolls. Sven is half fish. Technically not half fish, but half Maranth. Maranths are the sea peoples that Naga Siren, Slark, and Tidehunter all fall under. Anyways, uh, Sven's lore mentions how his mother was a Maranth, and that he is a bastard child. Personally, I speculate those weird protrusions on his helmet is where he keeps his fins folded up, but who knows. Bane Blink Dagger response. Blink Dagger! Ah! That's really all you need to know. Dazzle Inverted Ability Colors This refers to the fact that if you invert the colors of Dazzle's ability icons, they all seem to be a fitting color. All the purple-pink colors become green, which is associated with healing in most video games, including Dota 2. This implies that the Nothal Realm, a sacred dimension that Dazzle visited, is the inverse of ours. Uh, this is my headcanon, but I think the Nothal Realm could be the Nether Reaches, since the two heroes from there use green magic that hurts instead of heals. Undying loves gummy vitamins. This is a reference to a string of undying voice lines, most of which are unused, in which Undying rambles on about his need for gummy vitamins and how they're much healthier than gummies, and much better tasting than regular vitamins. I need gummy vitamins. Gummy which a lot like the gummy worms you get in Halloween. This is different though, it's healthy. What I like about them is they're chewy and they have a berry taste. Invoker had 27 spells. Back in Dota 1, the order in which you invoked your Quas, Wex, and Exor orbs mattered. This resulted in the additional 17 spells being added to his arsenal. I think it'd be cool to at least try this, but it would probably be an absolute nightmare to balance. Kunkka is... dead? Kunkka's lore states that it's not clear as to whether Kunkka is actually alive or just a ghost from a battle wandering around. I personally believe him to be a ghost because how else would he have all this weird water magic and whatever X marks the spot is. Not to mention the ability to summon the apparition of his crashing ship. Slosser's Way Slosser is a Dota YouTuber who is still active today. His content consists of wacky, borderline griefing builds that somehow work. His most infamous strategy involved support Faceless Void, which was chronoing everyone, effectively to pause the team fight, and use healing items on his team in the meantime. Placeholder Ability Icons A lot of the placeholder ability icons used during the development of Dota 2 are memey little doodles that were often puns on the ability name or something goofy like that. 
Going through these is a very enjoyable experience, and I really wish that Valve would put a little option in the menu that let you swap all the ability icons for their placeholders. Removed Heroes Some heroes that appeared in Dota 1 didn't make it to Dota 2 either because of their imbalanced gameplay or they were just a meme. The Gambler is the most famous example of this. He was a hero that dealt a lot with gold and RNG, and the whole thing was just a bit of a mess to balance, so he didn't get poured in. Bananas Dropping from Trees to tease the release of Monkey King, Valve did a sneaky little thing where, in custom lobbies with cheats enabled, trees had a small chance to drop bananas from them. It was an incredibly small thing, but it's always neat how Valve teases things like that. Chen is evil. This relates to the fact that Chen literally hypnotizes innocent campers on the battlefield to kill their own relatives and do his bidding. Enchantress does this too. Uh, it's kind of messed up now that I think about it. Item Name References a good chunk of item names are references to other media or, in a specific case, a Dota 1 developer. This is the case with Yule's Scepter of Divinity. Yule was the username of the guy who made the original Dota 1 map. That's right, the classic square with towers and lanes that you see in most MOBAs nowadays was designed by Yule back in, like, 2003, I think? Other references include the Octarine Core, referring to the color Octarine from the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett, which is described as a weird purple-greenish color that has a lot to do with magic. Then there's references to mythologies like Eye of Scotty, Mjolnir, and Gleipnir from Norse mythology, and Armlet of Mordigian from Lovecraftian Mythos. Rank 1000 tier. Ricky Deathward. Back in Dota 1, Ricky's ultimate used to be Witch Doctor's current ultimate. That's really all there is to say on the matter. Crystal Maiden is a psycho. In the Crystal Maiden Winter Wyvern comic, Crystal Maiden is depicted as... unhinged a bit. The locals refer to her as a lunatic. She sends death threats to her sister Lena, and has worryingly neat handwriting. Not a lot of these aspects of her character show up in game, except for maybe that one voice line about blood freezing. First blood, and it's already icing over! Earthshaker is fused with Dota 1 Earthshaker in his Arcana. This theory exists due to the fact that in his Arcana, Earthshaker carries his totem in a similar way to his Dota 1 version, and how the Arcana's lore mentions how he fused with a fragment of himself from another world. Void Spirit is Templar Assassin's master. This was speculated, but ultimately confirmed when Void Spirit released. Upon his release, Templar Assassin was given new voice lines where she refers to Void Spirit as her master. Destroying the Fountain In Dota 1, it was possible to destroy the enemy fountain. This would lead to some very unfun interactions if there was one particularly malicious team who enjoyed the suffering of others. This somewhat lives on in teams that just wait outside a fountain to spawn kill instead of ending the game. Vengeful Spirit throwing herself as a projectile Back in the Dota 1 days, Vengeful Spirit's auto attack would be her throwing her own model as, as a projectile. Corpse Mechanic Back in Dota 1, certain heroes had abilities that utilized slain creeps or heroes. This somewhat carried over to Dota 2. Really early on, Nyx Assassin had an ability that worked with a corpse mechanic, and for the longest time, the troll creep in the big camp would only summon skeletons if there was a slain unit or corpse nearby. Slark is a virgin. This refers to the one voice line Slark says when he's unalived. But I hadn't spawned yet! Spawning is how fish breeding is referred to. Um, don't ask me how or why, but that's where the term originated from. Sans Undertale Reference During the Silt Breaker event, there was an item called Oblivion's Locket that had the flavor text as follows. A skeleton's charm, used to prevent having a bad time. The reference to the bad time is an obvious callback to the encounter with Sans from Undertale, in which he tells you that you're about to have a bad time. There is another Sans Undertale reference hidden away in the Faceless Void Arcana. When starting the game, sometimes he'll say, You're going to have a bad time. You play as the Ancients. This refers to the fact that the Ancients, Dire and Radiant, mind control the heroes to do the bidding. But you, as the player, are controlling the heroes, so that can only mean that you are the Ancients telling the heroes what to do. I always think of this when my teammates start fighting. It's like a mind divided against itself. No Spells Strat The No Spells Strat was popularized by Purge Gamers & Co. when they were up against a Rubik. Their whole strategy revolved around never casting or even leveling their spells so Rubik wouldn't have anything to steal. 
In the end, they ended up winning. Top 100 tier. Every Dota match is canon. When Artifact was released, there was a lore comic that came along with it that stated how the main goal of these card mages were to try every possible timeline of events to try to get the Ancients to destroy each other at the same time. It's later revealed that just before an Ancient is destroyed, it winds back time back to the beginning and tries again, influencing the planet in different ways so that one hero performs better or that there are entirely different heroes participating in the fight in the first place. Even different cosmetic combinations are taken into effect. That's right, that one time where your Viper mid started running it down after getting ganked? Yeah, that happened in the Dota 2 universe, canonically. The River's Name uh, Just a heads up, this entry on the iceberg contains a slur. I won't discuss it here, but if you follow the link to the iceberg, that's a direct link to the source of where the River's Name came from. Necrophos Voice Glitch this is talking about a glitch with Necrophos, where sometimes his voice would be incredibly low-pitched and slow. It's fixed now, but, you know, it's kind of funny. This has crashed. Oh, yeah. Dota 1 is canon to Dota 2. This calls back to the earlier entry on the iceberg about Earthshaker's Arcana. Basically, the theory goes that since Earthshaker's Arcana is his Dota 1 and Dota 2 iterations fused together from different timelines, means that Dota 1 is canon to Dota 2. I personally don't subscribe to this theory, really. I mean, if Valve actually made this canon, I think Blizzard would have a thing or two to say about it. Terrorblade is an anti-hero. Terrorblade as a character is a demon feared by other demons. Additionally, he mostly targets other demons and those that he deems as false gods. He's friendly with Enchantress, and actually seems like a moral guy when you think about it. Useless Item In Dota 1, there existed a useless item. It was eventually removed, but if you had it, it gave no effects, no actives, and you couldn't sell it or drop it from your inventory. If I had to guess this was maybe a placeholder, I'm leaning towards this more being a, a, a small troll from Ice Rock, though. Timbersaw has PTSD and isn't crazy. In Timbersaw's lore, his hometown was the victim of a Treant attack. Some Isengard type shenanigans. Anyways, Timbersaw was the only survivor, and within the depth of his warehouse, he stowed away, working on a weapon that would get him out of this pickle. He built his mech, and the rest is history. Uh, but seeing your hometown torn and destroyed and your loved ones killed definitely has its effects on the mind. Not to mention this is a universe where trees most definitely 100% confirmed come to life and attack things. So no. Timbersaw isn't crazy for having a fear of trees, and definitely has some form of PTSD. Cancelled Dota RPG Valve once had plans to make an RPG game about Axe's journey through the world of Dota 2. Unfortunately, it was shelved. It was supposedly influenced by big name games like Elder Scrolls and Monster Hunter, but it probably won't ever see the light of day, unfortunately. A shame, to be sure. Top Rank 1 Tier Toss Avalanche bonus damage originated from a glitch. In Dota 1, there was a glitch in the code that made Avalanche deal more damage if a unit was being tossed. This was originally not ported over to Dota 2, but after fans demanded it be brought back, it was eventually ported over, and is in the game to this day. Arrested Development Bot Names A few of the default names in the game share the same names as characters in the show Arrested Development. Um, these bot names are Kitty, Tobias, Gob, Lupe, Marta, and Maybe. So if you ever see those names in your bot games, you know where they're from. Hoodwink's ability art references fan-made hero Danko the Dolphin. Danko the Dolphin was a fan-made hero created by We Play Esports. The ability icons of Danko have some shocking similarities to Hoodwink's icon abilities. If this has been confirmed to be a reference by Valve is unknown to me, but I really do hope it is the case and not just a coincidence. Dota 2 Flash Game. Definitely the most obscure item on the iceberg. This was a Flash game posted on Reddit in 2013. It's not playable anymore, and I couldn't find any footage of it, unfortunately, but from what I read in the comments on the Reddit post, it was pretty difficult. I believe the main reason it went out uh, was due to Flash shutting down in 2020. And that's it. That's the iceberg. Done and done. Thank you for making it this far in the video. It really means a lot that you stuck around to listen to me yap about my favorite game for... What is it, like an hour at this point? Um, 
So uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed the content. Um, stick a comment in the comment section if you have any questions or feedback. Uh, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Um, God bless, and until next time.